Welcome to In the Light with me, Anna Isabel, and I am an, a clinical and analytical hypnotherapist. With me today is my guest, Lionel Friedberg, who's written a brilliant book called Forever in My Veins. Welcome, Lionel. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Do you know, I've set aside, I, I set aside a little bit of time each day to, to read your book in preparation for our interview. And I've been looking forward to that time ever since I started reading it. It's, it's just, I think, colorful. It's colorful. It's um, a window into, into the past um, and, and into other cultures too. So perhaps I think it would be good if you told us a little bit about the title and then a little bit about why it is, what, what I mean when I say that it is a view of another time in places. Yes, well, um, I think I should perhaps preface my answer to you in this way, and that is I grew up in South Africa. Um, uh, and it was during the days of apartheid. Now, I'm not sure whether you're, all of your audience is aware of this or not, but during the time that I was a child in South Africa, apartheid was the system that, that, that ruled and defined that country. It was divided strictly down the middle on racial lines, white and black, completely separate. It was a vicious system that divided society down the middle and the train never met. Uh, and that came into force in, in 1948 when the Nationalist Party came to power in South Africa. And uh, apartheid was the law of the land. It wasn't a, a choice made by society in order you know, to, 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 to be racist, but it was the law of the land enshrined in the statute books. And that lasted until Nelson Mandela was released from prison in the 90s uh, when apartheid thank God, eventually disappeared from the, from the map, hopefully for all time in South Africa. Unfortunately, racism is still alive and well in the world. We see it all the time. But in South Africa during those days, it was the rule, it was the law. And you know, as a child, I, would, I was an only child, by the way. And um, so we, as a white privileged, you know, pri privileged white, if you like, we all had nannies and servants. And I had a nanny. And um, you know, if we'd go for a walk down the road, I would, as a child, four or five years old, you'd see a police van arrive and stop a black person on the other side of the street and go up and, you know, demand their papers because every single black person had to carry a, what they called a passbook. It was written permission for them to be in that area at that time. And if they didn't have this documentation on them, they could be arrested. Um, and if they didn't have the right permission to be in that area, they would be sent back to their tribal homeland which was way out in the sticks, you know, far away from the cities. The cities were the developed areas and they were sent back, you know, basically to rural areas, which is where they're, they're various, there are 11 different uh, tribes in South Africa, by the way. And so they would send back to, we, even if they were born in an urban area, they would be sent back to that area if they did not have written permission uh, to be in that area at that time. And I saw this many, many times as a child. You know, and I would say to my nanny, why are they doing that? She says, shh, don't ask, don't ask it, you know, don't, don't even talk about it. Um, and it was a subject that was never discussed uh, because it was forbidden, it was forbidden. You couldn't talk about it. It ruled every aspect of life, separate banks, separate beaches, separate churches, separate everything. It was horrible. And one intrinsic, intrinsically knew that, you could see that. Um, so I grew up in that kind of situation. And um, one day, uh, and let's, talk a little bit about the book and about the title, which you've asked about. Um, one day, I must have been about five or six years old. I think I was in the, in, in uh, maybe I was in the first grade, grade one, as you, as we used to call it those days in, in South Africa. And my, both my parents worked. And um, Thursday afternoons were, were, were servants days off. So if you had a servant working for you on Thursday afternoon from about two o'clock, they would have the afternoon off. And then of course they would have Sunday off as well and it was a, it must have been a Thursday afternoon because my nanny said to me I want to visit a friend this afternoon uh do you want to come with me you know I, I had no choice I said yes of course and we walked down the road and not to, we were living in a small town 
just to the east of Johannesburg, about 15 miles to the east of Johannesburg, which is where the big international airport is now. And we walked walk, walk down the road to see a friend of hers who lived like she did in the back of the yard of, of, of this white home and a little tiny little place at the back with cold water, no electricity, no hot water at all. And uh, she went down there to see this friend of hers. And when we got down there, um, there were a couple of other people waiting to go into this woman's room. Uh, black people, servants, other servants, because you know everyone had a day off. And I said to my nanny, what are they waiting for? And she said, uh, oh, they're waiting for her to finish because she's working with someone. I said, so what is she doing? And she said, well, she's also a doctor. And I thought, what? Uh, I, you know, being five and six or six years old, whatever, I, I, didn't, I didn't understand that. She's a servant. She scrubs floors. She does the laundry. She makes dinner. How can she be a doctor? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, she will show you when we go inside her room. And eventually the room, the door opened. And then these other two people went inside. They were there for about 15 minutes and they came out. And then the door opened and she welcomed us into her little tiny room. And, uh, you know, and when I went inside this room, I, the smells inside there were unidentifiable. I didn't know what I was smelling. And I also wasn't sure what I was looking at because the, the, the room was filled with objects that I could not identify. There were little containers of, of, of roots and berries and barks, animal skins hanging on the walls, things hanging from the ceiling. It was dim and dark inside there and the smells were absolutely amazing. In addition to the smell of paraffin and candle wax, because remember they had no electricity. They used to cook their own food in their rooms on these little primer stoves. Um, and I said to her, what are all these things? You know, and she said, well, these are my tools that I use as a doctor. These are my medicines. And I said, well, you know, like what? And she said, let me show you what I do. And she told me to sit down on the floor. And on the floor was this animal skin, this little grass mat. And sitting on the grass mat was a little animal skin bag. And she said, pick up the bag, which I did. And she said, now shake it. And I shook the little bag like this, and it, it went clink, clink, it sounded like marbles inside, you know, because I played marbles as a child. And she said, now turn the bag upside down, which I did. And what fell out onto the grass mat were little tiny bones and stones and pebbles and other little objects that I couldn't identify. There was a dice in there. There was a little piece of crystal, but most of them were little bones. Now I'm talking about tiny bones, the size of chicken bones and little knuckles and things from a goat and whatever else. And she said, those are my tools that I use as a doctor. And I said, how, how do you use them? And she said, well, when I throw these bones on the floor, they fall in a certain pattern. And then my ancestors tell me how to read or understand what the pattern is telling me. And that's how I can tell the person who has come to see me what is wrong with them. And I thought, God, this is like straight out of a storybook. It sounds amazing. Now, I had heard the word witch doctor, and that's the disparaging term, by the way, that was used by whites in those days for these people who practice this, this kind of healing. You know, oh, they're witch doctors. Ignore them. You know, it's all a lot of nonsense. It was completely dismissed by, by white society. So that was my introduction to that world. And many, many years later, my father, who was originally from Northern Europe, uh, he'd had enough of the apartheid system. And he said, you know, it's time to leave. We can't live in this system anymore. And um, he took a job in an area called Northern Rhodesia, which was a, a British territory, way up in the middle of Central Africa, right at the, at the southern border of what at the time was the Belgian Congo, middle of nowhere. He took a job in a little, he was a watchmaker by trade, by the way, and he took a job in a little jewelry store up there. And basically it was in a little copper mining town. And that's where he went, him and my mother. And, and I had finished high school when they decided to leave the country. And I said, I'm coming with you. And my mother said, you're not, you're staying here and you are going to go to university and you're going to get a degree. And I said, I'm not, because what I really wanted to do more than anything else in the world was to make movies. And ever since I was 11 years old, I had been making films for my friends, for my school, the debating society, sports meetings, birthday parties, that sort of thing. I'd been making little eight millimeter films. Now this is long before the days of video, you know, this was film and, uh, and that was my passion. 
And I used to go every Saturday to go and see a matinee at the local theater. And, you know, I love the movies. And I wanted to work in Hollywood and make movies about places like Africa. I wanted to make films like H. Ryder Haggard used to write King Solomon's Mines and, you know, the African Queen and things like that. That's what I wanted to do. So when my parents moved to Central Africa, I said, no, I'm coming with you. And I'm bringing my little camera with, and I'm going to start making movies. Well, they were mortified, but they couldn't, uh, you know, turn me against my decision. And I went with them. And when I got up there to this little tiny copper mining town, I looked around and I thought, what have I done? You know, there is bush and jungle from horizon to horizon and a copper mine and a tiny town. Where's Hollywood? Where am I going to make films? Nevertheless, we had a servant who worked for us. And every, every weekend I used to go out into the bush with him. And I used to go to little villages and make films about the, the local tribes, the, how people lived in, 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 in the bush. Ethnographic films, if you like, on a very unsophisticated level. I was, you know, still in my teens. I was maybe 16 or 17 years old. Um, and it was wonderful. But I thought, I can't do this for very much longer. I've got to find a career for myself. And then like manna from one day in the little local newspaper that served these copper mining towns, there was a tiny little ad in there looking for stuff for a new television station that was opening up in, in, in this area in, in, based in a town called Kitwe. And the television station was owned by a British South African company. And the reason why they were opening the station was to, to, to entertain the, the very well-to-do white community who was working in this, in, in, the, in this copper mining industry. But during the mornings, the idea was to have broadcasts for, for, for black school children who were at schools in the middle of the bush. There weren't enough teachers to go around. So the television station was going to do various things. And that was its purpose. And I knocked at the door and I said, you've got to let me in. I've got to work for you. And they let me in. And it didn't take me long before I was behind the camera. And that was the start of my career. And I had the most extraordinary experiences because in the mornings, we would have educational broadcasts in vernacular languages, which I didn't understand, but you know, that's fine. In the afternoon, we used to have tribal programming. People used to arrive in big trucks, dressed in all their regalia and drums and do these amazing dances. And the studio reverberated you know, to this amazing culture. And then at night, we would have the best of British and American television shows for the white audiences. So I lived in this multi-dimensional cultural world and it was magical. And I thought this is like a dream come true. However, we're talking about the early sixties and Britain and uh, Belgium and France and all the countries who had colonies in Africa were giving these colonies of theirs independence. So the first colony that went was, was Ghana, which Britain gave independence to Ghana. That was the first one. And then all these countries were given their independence one by one. And eventually it was the turn of Northern Rhodesia. Britain gave Northern Rhodesia its independence and it became the Republic of Zambia. And it was exciting times, um, but the problem was that the minute uh, Zambia was created, and I'm talking about 1964, October 1964, um, President Kenneth Kaunda, who was the president of the country at that time, he sent a notice uh, to the station. And he said, thank you very much for what you've done, all of you, but we're going to nationalize the station. It's now going to become a state-owned commodity. Um, and so we would like you all, thank you very much for what you've done, but you've got to leave. All your jobs are going to be taken over by local people, by, 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 by Zambians. We had no problem with that. We totally understood this sounded completely fair and above board. But my problem was, what was I going to do now that I was basically fired? You know, I wasn't going to be able to pursue my career. Where was I going to go? And um, so I had this terrible dilemma. How would I ever get to Hollywood from here? I didn't particularly want to go back to South Africa because apartheid was still alive and well. Although South Africa did have a pretty good film industry at the time. And we had a man, a young guy working for us. He wasn't much older than I was at home. 
and the next day after I got, uh, I've had this little pink slip, you know, saying, you know, thank you very much, but in six months you're out of here. And I, I said to him the next morning, I said, David, I don't know what to do. And he said, why, what's wrong? I said, well, you know, we've all, all of us at the station, we've at the studio, we've been asked to leave. My, our jobs are going to be taken over by Zambians. What am I going to do? And he said, ah, don't worry, I'll find an answer for you. And I thought, like what, how can you do that? And he said, I know someone. And you never know in Africa how things happen. Somebody knows somebody who knows somebody else who knows somebody else. And, you know, you turn left of that tree, you go beyond that valley and things happen. And that's how it happens in Africa. And he said to me on Thursday or whatever day it was, we'll go and talk to somebody and maybe you'll get some advice. So I thought, okay, great. I, I really, I needed guidance. What was I going to do with my life? Comes the day, there I was in my little beat up old secondhand VW Beetle trundling through, along a dirt road with David next to me. And he said, you just keep going. And we got to this little settlement on the outskirts of the town where I was living. And at the end of that settlement was a single little tiny house, literally, virtually a hut. And he said, this is the place. And I thought, David, <laughs> where is this? What, you know, who are we going to see? And he said, trust me. Well, I did. He was that kind of guy. I totally trusted the guy. And he knocked on the door and a little tiny little old lady came to the door opened it she was half blind you know and huddled over it was a hot day and she had a big blanket over herself she was a little bony finger you know she called us into her her hut and i went inside and the minute i stepped inside this little house of hers something happened i it's it's i, I, I there was like an instant connection to my childhood the smells inside that hut were exactly what I'd smelt as a child in that room many, many years ago in that uh, lady's room that I had visited with my nanny. And so what this woman was, was a healer. Now they go by many names. In, 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 in Zambia, they call themselves Ngangas. In South Africa, they go by the name of Sangoma. And Sangoma is a Zulu word, basically, which means soothsayer, fortune teller, healer, you know, psychic, whatever else. And these people wear many, many hats. You know, not only are they able to heal illnesses, but they are also able to communicate with, 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 with people who have passed onto the other side, to speak to the dead, if you like. And, um, and they do that in order to help you. Like, let's, let's say, for example, you, 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 uh, you, 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 you've lost something and you need to find something. They will consult with your ancestors and they'll get the answer to your problem. Uh, be it a marital problem or be it a physical problem or be it an illness. They do amazing things, these people. So there we were in this little woman's hut and she said, sit down. And I sat down and there was the same grass mat that I'd seen as a child and a little animal skin bag. And she could speak no English, but David was my translator. And she said to me, turn the bag upside down. Or David said, you know, she says, turn the bag upside down, which I did. And these little bones and things fell out onto the mat. And this little old lady leaned over them like this and she went like this, she clapped her hands and she said, oh, I cannot see anything. And David said to me, she can't see anything. She says, she wants to know what are the bright lights shining in her eyes? She was seeing something in this pattern of bones that had fallen on the mat. What she'd seen were the lights in the television studio. When I heard that, I knew that I'd better pay attention to what she has to say. And it was the most enthralling afternoon of my life because basically what she did was to predict everything that happened in the next 60 years of my life. She read it to me like a book. It's as though everything was forewritten and foretold. And she was seeing all of this in the way the bones and stones and little things had fallen on the mat. And she told me about adventures I would have, life-threatening incidents that I would experience, all of it. And every single thing that she told me has come true over 60 years. And some of the things that she told me were pretty scary. Uh, and I only realized that when the events actually happened. You know, I wasn't expecting them to happen as though you're reading a book and then uh, there's your guide, this is chapter so-and-so. It's only when they happened that I realized, oh my goodness, that's what that little old lady meant. And there were lots of incidents like that which I describe in detail in the book. Indeed. And I think that I could 
almost say a subtitle for your book would be Encounter with Magic, because it strikes me that you have, it's not so much, although it's true, you've lived a very magical life. Mm. It's, it's the fact that as you have been living your life, you've been weaving your, your path in and out of these magical cultures, experiences. And I guess the question I have for you is, how has that informed your personal development and growth? I think the overriding lesson for me has been that nothing is as it seems, that there is always more to learn. There's always more beyond the horizon, um, or what I call beyond the veil. Uh, around us, reality is not what it seems at all. There is so much more at play, be it uh, on, on a spiritual or psychic or metaphysical level, whatever you wish to call it. There is so much more to learn and discover about the world in which we live. And I've made films about subjects ranging from science to ethnography to all kinds of things. And I have always learned that there is so very much more than you think you see or that you know. And it has taught me that come to everybody, no matter who they may be, with the utmost respect and ask them to slowly reveal their, the, inner, the inner core of what makes them tick, who they are and what they've done. And, and I apply that to the subject matters that I do, whether it's to do with, uh, I, I did shows on the, on the, on the um, Soviet threat to the, to the oil route around, around the coast of Africa during the, the Cold War, for example. Uh, and, um, you know, I've done films, you, you name it. I, I, I did a, one of my favorite films is, is the story of the Voyager spacecraft that uh, went to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and met all the scientists and engineers and astronomers and all that. Um, in, in addition to, to things like, you know, people living in, 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 uh, in, in strange cultures all over the world. So it's been a, a very varied career. I've been very, very fortunate. I've been very blessed. And I've learned that, you know, you really need to come to every single single subject with utmost respect and be prepared to learn as much as you possibly can, because there is so much more. Never judge a book by its cover is so true. Um, some of the most extraordinary people are the people you least expect to be who they really are. And there's so much depth and so much more dimensional to things, be it a culture, be it an individual, be it a situation, be it a political setup, whatever it is. There's so much more to learn. And I think that the learning process never, never ends, no matter who one is. Every single day can be a learning experience. And it's amazing. And it's an adventure. We live in an extraordinary universe. We live in an amazing world. You know, um, just David Attenborough, the way he sees the natural world is so true. I've experienced that. And, um, but that applies to everything, even if it's the world of commerce. And I've done films which I regarded to be pretty boring subjects, but you, you try to make them interesting. You know, a film on economics, what can you do with that? I mean, how, how boring, but it's fascinating because that's what makes the world tick. And, you know, keep, keep peeling it all away and learn from that. And um, I try to make my films interesting, not just a, a learning, not, not just a documentary reflecting what it's about, but go as deep as you can and let the audience come away with something that can, they can relate to themselves in their own lives. The world is an exciting place. It's an extraordinary place. It's, um, I guess, in, in a way, about finding the beauty in everything. And even things you would consider to be dull, that there's beauty there to be. Mm. So with that in mind, uh, the word to discover, I think is a good one to say, um, if you want to discover more about Lionel's book, the title is Forever in My Veins. I promise you it is a great read. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. And um, I want to say thank you, Lionel, for joining us on In the Light today. 
Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate being here. And I, I'd just like to say to everybody, you know, we live in difficult circumstances. We live in a very, very difficult time right now. But take hope uh, because there's so much more. It's not, things aren't what they seem. There's always more beyond the horizon. And, you know, uh, we, be optimistic because the world is a very, very exciting place. And it, it, it pertains to every single one of us, all of us. And it I does. want to and I, and I love that message because it's about keeping your spirits high, because by keeping our spirits high, that's how we bring light into dark times. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Lionel, for that beautiful message. And next time, we are going to be talking about yoga with Keith Lowenstein. And I look forward to that. And thank you all for joining us today. Do remember to subscribe if you haven't already so that you can catch up with other interviews. Until next time, goodbye.